Media Literacy Conference of the Americas, and I'm also a professor at University of Southern California in the School of Communication. Um, I wanted to just inform you, you already got the notice that uh, we are recording this event, uh, this panel. So if you are under 18 years old or prefer not to be recorded, please turn off your video and remove your full name for anonymity purposes. If a problem occurs during this Zoom, first we ask you to try to re-enter the room through the link that you originally had. And if that doesn't work, you can go to the virtual lobby on the schedule of the conference where it says help or Ayuda. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce the, the panel and our panelists. So these panelists are don't have a title for the panel as a whole, but I'm going to create one, um, which is gender representation and critical media literacy. And I want to introduce the two panelists to you um, and they will speak in this order. And then we're gonna really hope to open it up for questions and comments. So first, uh, Natalia Marin Garcia is a professor and researcher at Universidad de Antioquia, Medellin, Colombia. Did I do that okay? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Okay. She holds a master's degree in foreign language teaching and learning. Her research and interests are focused on critical media literacy, gender, queer theories, communities of practice, and teaching Spanish as a foreign language. She was awarded a Fulbright grant in 2021, 2022, and that has brought her to where she currently is working as a pr Spanish professor and assistant at University of St. Thomas. St. Paul, Minnesota. So kind of different from Columbia. Um, and I want to also introduce Isabel Delano. Isabel uh, has research interests that converge on the areas of literary studies and feminist theory. Her research mainly focuses on gender violence and literary representations of gender dynamics. She is currently a PhD student at USC Annenberg. Um, before that, she graduated from the University of California, Santa Cruz with a BA in psychology and a BA in literature. During her time at Santa Cruz, she worked as a research assistant on a study investigating the ways in which heterosexual women internalize romantic scripts in media and how this affects their expectations for and acceptance of certain behaviors in their intimate relationships. Her senior thesis converged on a portion of that study, which analyzed the popular Netflix series, You, for its portrayal of romantic ideals and relationship abuse, with her work focusing specifically on ambivalent sexism in the show. So with that, I am going to take a step back and I'm gonna give the floor to Natalia. Thank you, Alison. And thank you everybody for joining us in this conversation. I'm pleased to be here and share my work with you. So I'm gonna do like some slideshow. It's gonna be short. Um, I want to share with you a brief, briefly like the work I did in, in my master thesis. And it's basically a, a, a work where I analyze, I and my students analyze the gender representations in Colombian media through CML. Um, the students were part of a group of adult e English learners in Colombia. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the journey we had. I used um, the empowerment spiral as an approach to uh, basically explore the gender representations in Colombian media. And so the students had a miscoupled the process of how to analyze media. So we went through these different stages, awareness, analysis, reflection, and action proposed by Tom and Jules. Um, the beginning of the process, we started to talk a little bit about concepts my adult learners, English learners that were just learning English, probably didn't know or were not very sure about. So we start concepts like sexism, feminism, chauvinism, um, gender representations, the concept of gender and sex. And uh, we uh, worked on some diagnosis or some activities that allow me um, in a certain way uh, evaluate or have an idea of what their gender representations were at that moment, at that point of, of the semester when we started the class. So 
one of the activities that made part of this uh, uh, diagnosis was uh, an activity uh, we, we did in class. It was like a conversation about, uh, what, based on this question, if an alien came to her, what would you teach them? So students came up with different ideas about how uh, women or men should behave in this planet, the way they should look like, the, their behaviors. And it was like very funny and at, a, at the same time sad to, to realize that they have these stereotype ideas about, uh, uh, about, uh, about us, right? About our different roles. So uh, I kept this information for the end of the project so that they could have self-assessed self what they had said at the very beginning of the project and, and, and see the, the things they changed or, or the things they, they felt differently along the process. So then we went on the second phase about analysis and we did analysis basically, uh, at the beginning it was like simple analysis, identifying gender representations in Colombian media. So these are just instances of some of the artifacts I brought to class. Um, I tried to translate some of these because they are in Spanish. Um, uh, one of my aims uh, was that basically, of course, in Colombia, we are so influenced by media, by American media and other cultures like Korean, for example. Uh, nowadays, uh, our teenagers in Colombia, they love Korean culture. They know a lot about American culture. But I didn't want to focus on that type of media. I wanted to focus on Colombia, media produced in Colombia, media in Spanish, in our language, and the portrayals of our own culture. So that's why this is like some of the things that we could get. And these were some of the instances I got at the beginning. Students uh, identify some of the um, ideas, representations, and ideologies behind this, the messages they were conveying. Um, and it was like a very, uh, at the beginning, of course, it was like a simple analysis because the idea was to scaffold this process. So we helped ourselves with the core concepts and key questions proposed by Tom and Joel's. You might be so familiar with this if you have been working with critical media literacy. Plus other questions that also helped us in this process. So who created this message? Which were the techniques used to, to attract the attention? So we evaluated like the different colors, uh, the colors of the clothing of the girls, for example, the man in the middle, the position, the angle of the cameras, all these different uh, techniques that help us understand better how something or how a media uh, message is constructed. Then uh, later on, we also, um, I also proposed an analysis where students could contrast uh, how oh, these gender representations were portrayed in the early 90s, uh, 2000, and then comparing to what we are currently have in our Colombian media. So this, is, this was a comparison of a TV commercial in the 90s, like it's called Blanquita, it's a woman that we usually see on TV, on Colombian TV, cleaning uh, with bleaching, like this is like the product she advertises. And so Blanquita, her name is Blanquita, and it's a black woman cleaning. Uh, that was what we used to see in the 80s, like women cleaning or advertisements of cleaning, having women at the center or promoting these cleaning products. And then we got this other one uh, in 2017, three years ago, four years ago. And it was a TV commercial about Salvo, who is, which is also a cleaning product. And now we have like the inclusion of a man. So apparently we say, oh, apparently the Colombian messages and media messages are now more inclusive. Now we have a man there. Uh, but then when you see the entire TV commercial, you see that the role of the woman is washing the dishes, doing the dishes and the man is cooking. So um, it's like a kitchen, it's like they, they have like a business and they are selling like some food, but the woman is doing the dishes and the man is cooking. So we analyzed the, like what the apparent, um, the, the apparent equity that media in Colombia is trying to portray, but that we, 
could say, or I, I could quote an author who says that this is like a cos cosmetic bias, um, something that apparently um, shows equity uh, um, among the representations of gender, but at the end, when you analyze it deeply, you you might end up seeing the same the same perpetuation of um, of inequality among um, women and men in this case. So, um, moving beyond um, uh, at the beginning, I uh, I told you we did this identifying uh, gender representations but we also went to an exploration of the history to understand why these advertisements, these billboards, for example, are common in our city. I'm from a city called Medellin in Colombia, and this city is uh, very recognized because it has beautiful and gorgeous women, but not only beautiful and gorgeous women, but uh, also because there is an increasing, um, uh, increasing, increasing level of plastic surgeries in women and men as well. And it started with women. Nowadays, we can see like men are also in this. So we read and we analyzed why is this so common for us? Like in our lenses as Colombians, this might look like something very normal, but probably if you see this billboard in another country, if you see it in United States and Mexico or whatever you are, you won't see it with the same, the same lens I have in my mind. Of course not, because this is so contextualized. Um, so it's, uh, we read the history of um, cosmetic surgeries, plastic surgeries in Colombia. And we, in order to understand better why this type of messages are around us, and so it basically dates back to um, the traffic, traffic, um, trafficking uh, time and the violent time in Colombia, like in the nineties, when these traffickers or dealers wanted to have power in every sense. So they got like different girlfriends and girls, and they wanted to have like the most beautiful girls. So they sponsored and paid surgeries to to women. And that's why in this moment in the 90s, starting in the, in the early 90s, the boom of plastic surgeries started to increase. And, um, and, and it became popularized in, in the city, in Medellin. So you might not find the same thing in Bogota, which is the capital of Colombia. You might not find the same thing that in Medellin that has a different historical moment. And, and this, of course, it's impacted our culture. And that's why we see this type of adverse advertisement in our city. Um, so apart from uh, looking at advertisements or gender representations in simple ways, like examining the colors or the font or the position of women, we also went beyond exploring the history of these messages. And these, of course, helped us to understand better um, our context and why the, the different messages they were they wanted to convey and what they wanted to believe in, right? Okay, also in this exploration of gender representations, we, we found out that although Colombia is like a very conservative place, religious conservative place, um, and you might not see very often like TV commercials or advertisements or movies uh, where you can see like the different rainbow of sexual orientations this bank, which is one of the most famous banks in Colombia, released a campaign uh, and they call, they call it like, it's the moment of the new families. And so they had different pictures around the city with different types of families, including this uh, diverse family. So in our analysis with my students, they say like, oh, apparently, okay, we're progressing. and. And, and now we have, we can see different uh, messages around the city because they are promoting different types of families. But of course, if you go deeply and dig deeply into these representations, you might, um, you might see uh, that, you, know, you might question that this is also a very typical representation of a gay family with a dog. And this of course uh, can be uh, understood as 
differently because in Colombia, for example, the adoption is, uh, is not allowed by, um, I mean, I mean uh, adoption by a gay, fam a gay family, for example, or a rainbow family is not allowed yet. So we, have, we haven't progressed enough in the sense of that's why this portrayal is with a dog and, and it's not a baby, right? So um, different um, analysis, we, we, we went on a journey of, of the analysis of different representations of gender in media in Colombia together with my help at modeling with some questions I proposed. And then there was a moment where they, um, had the chance to select by themselves, the students had the chance to select the artifacts they wanted to analyze. Um, um, and uh, this one, this is an example, this is an instance of one of the artifacts one of the students selected. And it, it caught my attention and that's I wanted to share it with you today because this student, uh, although my project was in relation to gender, this student went beyond and he talked about intersectionality at that time. I was not even aware of what intersectionality was. I was so young. And so I said like, oh, oh okay, this is super interesting because uh, we know that uh, the different dimensions of identity shouldn't be analyzed, uh, isolated in an isolated way. Um, the experience a woman like this, I will show you the video, is not even more, not even a minute. I will show you the video. And I will try, and um, probably the people who know Spanish will understand it, but uh, if you don't, uh, I will explain what, what she said. So I will show you the video and tell you what, what we found based on this. I hope you see and hear the video. My name is Pilar, I come from the litoral. I came to Papayán with a desire to study. But the thing was not easy when they started to talk. I was a employee and I was thinking it was for talking. Until one day someone told me, come here. Tengo ropa for planchar. Hasta hambre ya me dio por solo verte pasear y tus caderas contonear. Porque así como camina, yo me como tu pegado. Yo con rabia lo miré. Por poco casi lo insulto, pero yo con mi disgusto solo me puse a pensar de lo duro que es ser negro y mujer acá. So, um, with this video, oh, one of the students selected this video and he analyzed that, uh, of course, the experience of this woman um, it wasn't the same. The, the level of uh, her experience or, or the, le the level of discrimination for a black low class uh, women was not going to be the same than for a white upper class woman, for example. So in with this analysis, he started this conversation. So we started to think about intersectionality, how all these dimensions of our identities privilege some or, or disadvantage some and, and advantage others. And, uh, and this was like basically the starting point on how I started to talk or to study more um, the different dimensions of identity, not only gender, but also connecting it with others. Well, I'm gonna stop presenting this and to finish and um, invite Isabel to the conversation. I will show you the last slides. So, in this process of analysis, um, uh, the students also had the chance to create alternative uh, tests and also counter-hegemonic tests. So they were invited to get involved into this deconstruction process. And uh, they took some advertisement um, and they transformed it. Some others uh, decided to do counter-hegemonic counter tests like counteract to messages, um, basically conveying, this is in a reggaeton song, uh, which is part of our culture in Colombia. It was um, very beautiful because these strategies helped them to understand better how, um, how what is our role as audiences we are con when we are consuming these different messages um, that sometimes are pervasive, right? And that it, 
could be very damaging if we're, we are not aware of what we are uh, consuming. And uh, finally, it, well, the results of these projects were many and were fantastic, but because of time, I'll, I won't tell you like all the results we got from the project. The only thing I wanted to tell you is that um, this project uh, that was basically led with the intention of raising awareness about gender representations in Colombia and also uh, promoting language learning ended up being something beautiful. And the discussions we were having in classes were transcended to their families. So these auto, this group of auto learners, they had children. One of them was a teacher in a high school. So we started to have conversations about our role as adults uh, when evaluating, when deconstructing, when uh, consuming media. And so um, they brought to the class their experiences with their families. This is an instance of one of the students who had like a situation with her sister that was planning a birthday party for her son. And so she couldn't find like cupcakes that were blue color for his party because it was a boy. So she was like so concerned because she didn't, she just found like pink and brown cupcakes and so this, the student of the class said, like, I couldn't understand my sister. And, and well, and at the end, I don't blame her. Like we have been, we, we have grown with these ideas in our minds. Like we have been told that colors make a difference that if you are a boy, you should wear blue or, or green or whatever. And so this, uh, this might um, make it different if you're just using a pink color in a party, in a boy party. So the conversations were fantastic. The results were great. And this was a great journey with them. And well, uh, now I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna give the turn to Isabel so that we can continue with the conversation. And for sure, if you have questions and we can address them later. Thank you. Um, okay. Let me just share my screen. Okay, uh, hi, I hope everybody can see that all right. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, and Natalie, Natalia, thank, thank you for a great uh, first presentation to start us off. Um, so I'll just start off first with a little bit about me. Um, so I'm a graduate student at uh, USC. Uh, USC is also home to the Media Project, which is a group of scholars, which is headed by Alison Trope here, um, that do work around encouraging and developing critical media, media literacy for youth populations. Um, and the project that I'm going to be discussing today uh, comes out of this group and is focused on cultivating critical media literacy for youth on the topic of gender violence. Now, clearly, this is not a light topic. Um, and so several issues arose in this process. Um, so first, just a bit of background into this project. Um, one of the tools that CMP puts forth for educators are what we call playlists, um, which are lists that are centered around a specific topic that contain links to media examples relevant to that topic, um, as well as discussion questions that are designed to encourage critical media literacy. These are primarily meant to be tools for teachers to then utilize within their classroom. Um, and my project with CMP was in creating a playlist on representations of gender violence in the media. Um, and this emerges uh, out of some of my prior work, which was actually looking at uh, the popular Netflix series You, which is a show about sort of serial gender violence. Um, and as sort of demonstrated by that show um, and its popularity, I think the uh, third season was just released on Netflix yesterday, um, as well as um, this quote from Dua Lipa, uh, and as well as empirical research that mainly comes out of cultivation theory. Um, popular media can be a source of gendered scripts. Um, and so what happens when these scripts then include violence? Um, so in creating a playlist around representations of gender violence in the media, we 
need to encourage young viewers of this content to reflect critically on the harmful behaviors that they see on screen. And one of the first struggles that we came up against in creating this playlist was how to define gender violence. So some academics and activists use the term synonymously with the term violence against women, um, and others talk about gender violence more in relation to domestic or intimate partner violence. So for the purposes of this playlist, we define gender violence as referring to violence enacted on the basis of someone's sex or gender identity. And this often takes the form of stalking, sexual assault, sexual harassment, and intimate partner violence. Um, in choosing content for the playlist, so we chose because of frequency in the media and taking into account these other focuses of the definition of gender violence, we chose mainly to focus on violence against women and on violence within a romantic relationship. Um, but we do also discuss the media portrayal of violence against transgender and gender non-conforming folks. Um, so here I just have a couple of examples of the type of media um, that we chose for this playlist. We drew from a wide array of mediums, including Twitter, YouTube, news outlets, advertisements, um, and of course, film and television. Um, and of course, gender violence is a very difficult topic to discuss within a classroom setting. Um, and so based upon some of the tenets of trauma-informed pedagogy, we did a suggestion at the top of the playlist that uh, educators provide students with a content warning. Um, acknowledging their potential trauma and, emotion, um, and emotional reactions to the content discussed. We also suggest that educators allow students to opt out of the discussion and or viewing of the content, and that they provide students with resources for support and information on activist work around gender violence. Um, but be because this is such a uh, difficult topic, um, you might ask, why should we be discussing this content with teens? Um, for one, gender violence is quite unfortunately something that many young folks deal with. Um, so I'll point to some statistics uh, reported by the CDC about the frequency of dating and sexual violence. So the CDC reports that one in, one in 11 female and approximately one in 14 male high school students report having experienced physical dating violence in the last year. They also report that one in three female rape victims experienced it for the first time between 11 and 17 years old, and one in eight reported that it occurred before age 10. Nearly one in four male rape victims experienced it for the first time between 11 and 17 years old, and about one in four reported that it occurred before age 10. Beyond though, those statistics on the frequency of gender violence among youth populations, holding this discussion uh, in classroom settings aims to demonstrate the prevalence of harmful gender scripts in the media. Uh, plenty of work coming mainly from cultivation theory, as I mentioned before, uh, suggests that media, and in particular television and film, may be a source of gender scripts. So if young populations are using media portrayals, among other things, to formulate gender scripts, um, and in particular gender scripts within romantic relationships, and at the same time uh, are experiencing dating violence and sexual assault and harassment, then their process of making sense of the violence that they've encountered, either through their personal experience or, or through the person, or through the experiences of other around them may be impacted by the media narratives of gender violence which they have encountered. And I think that this is why critical media literacy about this topic in particular is so important. Um, and one final note on, one, on why I believe this playlist is so important. Even if these teams don't have personal or proximal experiences with gender violence, they still live within a patriarchal society, one in which rape culture prevails in the media and which gives rise to statistics such as this, which comes from a study uh, from UN Women and finds that 97% of women aged 18 to 24 living in the UK experience some form of sexual harassment. Um, and I'm ending 
doing this right now on a somber note for a somber topic, um, but I really do appreciate all of you taking the time to listen as I've introduced this topic. Um, and then I will stop sharing and turn it over to questions. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, I really enjoyed hearing both of those pieces and sort of thinking about how they interrelate. I'm going to just jump off with one question um, because I think one of the interesting things about both of these um, presentations is the question of audience um, because you're both sort of thinking through that question of what is the right audience or what is a, an important audience that, that maybe is unengaged or needs to be engaged tied to this particular content related to gender representation uh, writ large. So um, Natalia, do you wanna start off and just talk a little bit more about why adult education and CML, but CML specifically tied to gender is, is so crucial for your work? Yeah, thank you, Alison. That's a really interesting question. And I, that was actually my, my starting point. I uh, was looking for a gap to start my my master's thesis, and I was reading CML, different CML research and uh, different gender works, uh, in, not only in my country, but also internationally. And what I mainly found was that um, almost all the work developed was mainly with children and teenagers. And the main argument is that uh, this is the population or this is these are the audiences that are more prone to manipulation. And so, um, Apparently, like we are all concerned about uh, kids and teenagers because they are the ones consuming these messages. They don't have enough tools to deconstruct and analyze and, and understand, and, and they might be very manipulative, but uh, manipulators are bad. What about adults? Like, we are having these conversations, right? Like, we are here together. Like, because we still need to learn like and uh, it was so interesting like having these conversations with my adult learners uh well they are not mine <laughs> the, the adult learners i had the chance to to share with um because um it, most of them were parents one of them was uh, a teacher in a high school so they were not thinking only about themselves they like probably, oh yeah, I, I, I'm questioning my own beliefs about gender, but all the things that I'm believing and, and that I'm uh, uh, like all my principles or all the things that, uh, that uh, I'm supposedly sure about, or I, I'm, I'm very steady with these beliefs, I'm transmitting or I'm probably teaching all these things to my kids. And so one of the beautiful conversations we 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 got in in our classes was like oh my gosh my son asked me that he wanted to have a dancing doll and he's a he's a boy and I say like how come you're asking me for for a for the doll if you are a boy so she say like I realized that I did that and with this conversation uh, teacher like I'm realizing that I'm, I'm probably falling in this same stereotype of a boy cannot play with a doll and a girl cannot play with a car. And so they started to question their own beliefs and, and fixed ideas. And what was so important is that they were bringing these conversations to their families, to their classes, in case of the teacher I had in my class. And so that's why it is important because we are not anywhere we're not and that as human beings, we need to challenge ourselves, deconstruct and rethink and reconstruct our beliefs every single day. And that's why we're here sharing, right? Thank you so much. Actually, the, the impetus for me starting Critical Media Project was having parents come up to me and say, is this kind of education available, you know, for our children? So they were thinking about their children, but they were also sort of thinking about themselves that they never got this education. And, and so I think it, it does become almost like a public health issue or a public, you know, um, you know, civic issue that, that we need to think about. So Isabel, um, you mentioned this in your talk, but if you could talk a little bit more and maybe we can dialogue about this because one of the uh, audience members, Rihanna asked, um, where is the gendered violence playlist? 
And I will admit, Isabel finished the gender violence playlist a long time ago, and I've been dragging my feet about putting it up because of some of the issues Isabel raised. So I would love to sort of broaden this into a larger conversation um, around the issue of what is appropriate for children, what is appropriate for youth. My, this website, Critical Media Project, is open and free. It's it, Anyone can access it. So what is our responsibility um, you know, in terms of framing these topics, in terms of putting certain media on that may be traumatizing? And, and is it enough for us to just provide these sort of content warnings and framing at the top of a playlist? Or are there other things we need to consider um, when the target audience for the site is middle school and high school youth? So if you wanna riff on that a little bit and then maybe other people have ideas. Yeah, I, I mean, one thing to mention with uh, the playlist that we've created is that um, none of the solutions that we use in uh, doing this playlist are like actual solutions for the, the question overall. Um, like it's a much broader question uh, that's still ongoing. Um, and so, yeah, I, I pointed out uh, some reasons why I, I think that this is an important topic that um, you know uh, is necessary to have, even despite its its potential risks. Um, but, but I mean, we're we're presenting this uh, playlist and compiling a list of media that is that has very traumatizing content, um, and we're in you know a, a context that. Um, you know, isn't very therapeutic or, or trauma-informed for the most part. Um, trauma-informed pedagogy is still kind of taking hold and, and hopefully, uh, you know, uh, continuing to be improved upon, but it's, um, it's still in early stages, I think, and still very difficult. Yeah, I think that is really key that we are not all clued in as educators to how to handle the trauma of, of our students and, and sort of navigate that. Um, Rihanna. Hi, thank you. My dissertation is specifically exploring how uh, critical media literacy should be used as a tool of sexual violence prevention. And uh, I completely see this as highly problematic. It's littered our, our social media, particularly those aimed at young adults, is littered with messages that constantly blur the lines between sexual violence and consent. And so kids are already immersed in it. And I think it's so important. And I, I'm looking at your, your content. And I think that that's a, a short site because students are already exposed to this. And so not naming it as sexual violence, I think is part of the problem because they're watching the media that you're talking about. But what's missing is that this is stalking. This is rape. This is sexual harassment. So from the perspective of someone that's deeply passionate about it, I would encourage you to put the content on there. That's just my two cents. Thank you. Thank you. I'm okay. I'm, I'm going to just do it and see what happens. <laughs> I, I'm wondering if, Rihanna, you were also talking about other content on the site that you think didn't fully address the issue, or you're talking about we should just put the, the playlist on. I think, I think this playlist is so significantly important because we're not having these conversations with kids. And so yeah. they're exposed to it without understanding yeah. that it is criminal behavior. Yeah. And yeah. that I think is such a key component into decreasing the prevalence. Great, thank you for your input. Okay, Isabel, that's a vote for putting it on and seeing what happens. Um, any other? And maybe Rihanna will get your email and share it with you ahead of time. Um, any other questions or thoughts for Isabel or Natalia? You could put them in the chat. Oh, Andrea. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to thank you so much uh, for uh, your really brave and important work. I really appreciate it. 
I'm wondering in your perspective, um, where do you see your work going next? What do you envision or hope for? And, and just from a practitioner perspective, any recommendations that you have for K through 12 or higher education teachers striving to really have real authentic dialogues that go beyond the service level in the classroom? I'd be grateful for just any advice as um, a newcomer to the field. Yeah, Andrea, thank you for, for your question. And I think that this question makes us think so. And I'm thinking about my process because I started along exploring this. Like I was just a beginner uh, doing my thesis project with my advisor. And um, probably uh, in Colombia, we're lagging behind in terms of gender and progress and uh, critical media literacy as well. Um, so we were exploring paths that uh, probably you no know, many people had explored. And I started, uh, I would say it was like a very individual process. And then I, I, knew I was so lucky to find like a community, a group of professors that wanted to join me, that invited me to make part of a project, also an exploratory project uh, with queer theories and, um, now we are uh, talking about critical media literacy and queer theories and how to address these topics in our classes with our adult learners. So um, uh, it's different working from a community in this collaborative and this collaborative uh, process, like collaborating with each other, having these uh, fantastic conversations, things that you won't see by yourself when you are individual in this process of your research work you're just you and your advisor and that's it so i think it's important uh, andrea to to start finding community collaboration and uh, joining efforts like working with somebody else and knocking on the doors of people that have progressed or that have probably well, walked this path <laughs> before um and so, yeah, I would say that that's the direction and that's where I'm going. Um, I don't personally have much experience uh, working like in the classroom or with um, you know, uh, students directly, um, but I love everything that Natalia just said. Um, and I also think that you know, one of the things in uh, my project in creating this playlist um, is the uh, emphasizing the way that we are educated through media um, and that media is a source of education um, for especially young people. But I mean, you're continually develop, you're continually developing things like gendered scripts um, throughout your lifetime as, as Natalia is working with adults, you know, and um, you can really see that. Um, so um, yeah, that's one argument for, for this playlist is just that there's a, a process of education through media that isn't always uh, as transparently uh, identified as, as I hope it uh, should be. One other thing um, that we didn't mention about all the playlists that we have on the site, Isabel alluded to it, is that we try to put the hands of the media making, the critical media making into the, the folks that are looking at the playlist. So at the end of every playlist, it says your turn and it invites you know, um, counter narratives and responses. And, and so I think going back to Rihanna, also what Rihanna was talking about in terms of the, the prevalence of these messages, it hopefully will allow people to turn those messages around. And we have had just anecdotally several young people um, who we've been working with because we work in local schools, uh, make films about intimate partner violence that they are experiencing at this very young age, given, you know, sort of echoing the, the stats that Isabel shared. Um, does anyone else have another question? Comment? I feel like I'm back in the Zoom classroom with lots of black screens here and avatars. 
dogs, all kinds of stuff. Um, another question I had, and, and this, this was actually a question that Isabel came up with, and I think it nicely ties into the fact that Natalia used uh, examples from Colombia, is thinking about um, how can we, as a field, critical media literacy field, really sort of lean into intercultural perspectives, transnational perspectives or transnational media. Um, I mean, we, we've been thinking about that with Critical Media Project, how can we bring in um, not only, again, thinking about audience, not only more global audiences that are steeped in American media, but also how can we expose folks, you know, to, to media from other places and sort of think about the, the cultural specificity, but also the ways in which we have these, um, the transference of these same gender norms and gender scripts, for example, across um, borders. Um, yeah, one thing that I was thinking of, you know, when, when posing this question is um, uh, sort of streaming, so, streaming services and some like increasingly transnational content uh, that they have on, on their sites. So uh, we can even think of Squid Game on Netflix and its wild success um, in this past month uh, um, as evidence of that, as evidence of uh, increasingly transnational uh, media literacy, sort of. Um, and one thing that I was thinking of as, as Squid Game was coming on was um, how this is exposing, uh, how maybe young viewers are increasingly learning about gendered scripts in an intercultural context. Um, so like someone watching Squid Game um, would be if they hadn't already been familiar with uh, Korean culture or Korean uh, gender dynamics, um, they may be learning about that. Although that's not a focus of Squid Game, it still is present in there, of course. Um, and so they may be, you know, learning uh, about Korean gender dynamics through something like Squid Game at any stage of their life, young or or already um, or older. Yeah. Yeah, I would say like, yeah, like that's a very interesting question. Um, we as uh, agents, political agents, I mean, we are so responsible in our classes, like playing this role of, of teachers and professors of leaders of the class, playing the role because we're finally playing a role there. We have a big responsibility um, in terms of um, learning and being updated with what's going on, right? Like it's always talking about different series on that, from Netflix, right? And I, you immediately made me think of all these things going on among, um, like with teenagers when a new series is released and something is happening there and they start to simulate and they start to do these things. I remember clearly this example of a series uh, that is called <clears throat> Different Ways to Kill Sarah or something like that. So um, the kids were emulating and were like threatening, bullying uh, older girls from the classes because of the influence of the series. So I think our responsibility as uh, professors and teachers in our classes, we need to be updated with what's going on, even if we are not into this uh, series, like we should know what's happening, what is the, the media that our students are consuming so that we can know or at least uh, try to find a way to approach what is happening, what they are talking about, the conversations they are having, or the actions they are taking, the, the games they are playing. And, and so that we can have a, an accurate intervention there, right? So um, yeah, I, I definitely think that we have a huge responsibility in this, uh, especially when consuming transnational media, if that's the word, um, being updated, being into what's happening. I know it's difficult because there are many things going on, but at least try to find what what your students are, are, 
are dealing with and what they are consuming, that might be very useful. Yeah, I think these are really important kinds of think, things to think about in terms of approach. And I think one of the difficulties in, in thinking about the transnational context is, is just the context part, right? Because we don't necessarily know what um, the production context or the, the kind of gender scripts that are specific to Colombia compared to another country. And so it makes it difficult to even do the work of critical media literacy in terms of analyzing without knowing some of those things and doing more labor to do the research. But I think it's, it's definitely a necessity and nonetheless. Um, and I think that's what sites like Critical Media Project are are really trying to do is provide a little bit of context and then these kinds of questions, this kind of inquiry-based approach. Um, more questions, we have about 10 minutes. Or more thoughts from our presenters. I had another um, kind of question that, that uh, both of you sort of address to some degree, but you know when we think about gender representation, you know we we typically think about more typical cisgender representations in terms of how we talk about those representations in the media. Um, increasingly, we are seeing. I mean, you showed a gay family, Natalia, and one of yours, and Isabel. I know you worked hard to incorporate transgender and non-binary um, scripts and, and representations. But um, just thinking about how we, we sort of tackle a gender spectrum in relation to, to these issues. And if, especially going back to the, the question of, I think that's easier to do, frankly, with the youth population sometimes than it is the adult population. Right, so how comfortable are adults and how do we sort of make room for them to have these conversations that are increasingly important? Yeah, um, I don't know. Um, somebody said that probably you were not hearing me well. <laughs> I tried to use my earphone and I don't know if it's working well. I think it's there's just a little feedback. Okay, but mm, can you understand? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. And I took it off, like I unplugged it and I cannot hear you. Like I try unplugging my earphone and I, and I couldn't hear you anymore. So let's try this way. Um, um, the conversations with adults uh, about gender and the wide spectrum of gender Although I didn't have like any agenda in mind, like I was not uh, thinking about uh, binary concept of gender. I was so open, but still my first time exploring these issues. So I was also learning. I, I have to be honest, I was I not very um, experienced in uh, talking about addressing these topics. Um, I learned with them. I would say I, I learned with them and we had these conversations. It was difficult for them. It was difficult for me as well. I would say uh, I was learning and having, we were learning together to have this open conversation. And I think it was very interesting because mainly because of the fact of their children. And uh, um, because they might say like, my song, like we had some intimate conversations that at a point, one of the girls, one of the girls from the class was saying like, my song has certain behaviors and I, I'm, I feel sometimes, sometimes doubtful if he's gay, but I, I'm, I'm afraid to think about this idea. And I don't know why I'm afraid of that. Like, I shouldn't be afraid of that. So she found like, this was like a very, um, beautiful environment to share those intriguing questions for her, those questions that she probably hadn't uh, had the chance to have uh, with, or these conversations she didn't have the chance to have with probably her son or, or another person because she felt kind of ashamed. She didn't know what to think about it. She didn't know how to address these topics. So I would say it, it's 
uh, it was like a matter of generating a, a very comfortable space, a safe space, a safe space for addressing these issues. And although you might feel in some cases resistance to talk about this, or you might feel adults are afraid of talking about this, um, little by little, it was like a step-by-step -step process. Little by little, we all learned um, to, we all learned and we felt safe to express what, what we wanted to express in relation to gender. So yeah, it was a beautiful process. Um, yeah, so um, the rep representation of uh, transgender folks in, in media is, is really complicated. And so putting this playlist together uh, was quite difficult in that regard um, because so we have a, a gender playlist already on the site. Um, and in that, I think there's some uh, media examples that specifically touch on um, gender nonconformity, transgender, um, and all of that. But when we're talking about or looking at gender violence specifically in the media, um, a lot of uh, what is represented, a lot of the representation of transgender people um, on screen and television comes in, in crime shows. Um, and they're either portrayed as victims or as villains. And um, that is, is very much a limit. Um, and so, you know, the sections of, of this playlist that are focused on um, romantic relationships and uh, abuse and domestic violence within romantic relationships are, are really lacking um, representation of, of transgender uh, media portrayals in that regard, um, as well as just the everyday kind of harassment and all of that that, that, that transgender people face. Um, so it was hard in that regard because our, our playlist is limited to media that exists. And so, um, yeah, it, it was just an issue sort of, of, of representation. Yeah, um, I think that's that's a really good point. It's you can only, I mean, talk about what what we have, but but again, that your turn piece of a, of the playlist allows um, folks to to be creative and create their own narratives to some degree. Um, any other final thoughts people have? Share in the chat one takeaway from, from the session. How about that? Not even getting engagement that way. Come on, please. <laughs> I, I have a question. I'm just wondering, um, as you're engaging in this work, and I think I'm a, I'm a, I'm a PhD candidate at UCLA and I'm studying critical media literacy with powerful, amazing teachers. And we've been talking a lot lately about as we're engaging in this work, that, that reflective piece and, and what you all shared made me, made me think so much of the importance of inward reflection. I'm wondering, and you know, this might be too much, but how do you take care of yourselves in this process? Because I, I recognize that, that this work is heavy and it's raw and it's real. And, I'm just wondering any advice that you might have for how you engage in really taking care of yourselves during this process. I'd be so grateful if you wouldn't mind sharing. Go ahead, that's beautiful, that's beautiful. Go ahead, Thank you. Um, yeah, this is a, a wonderful question and a really difficult one. Um, because <laughs> I, I mean, I am, you know, studying uh, gender violence and romantic relationships in particular at a time when I'm also trying to like have relationships of my own. And that's like, it bleeds over for sure. Um, and and is, is quite difficult to manage. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure that I have like super grounded or 
or specific advice. Um, but I think that honestly, um, the, the developing of, of critical media literacy for me, like myself, and my process of developing critical media literacy, um, I find that to be therapeutic. Um, so like seeing all of these representations of gender violence is really, really harmful. But I found that as I'm going through this and analyzing and, and talking about it with other people, I think that's an important part of this, talking about it with other people, um, that that's actually uh, very beneficial for me. Um, yeah, I agree with it. So that that's a difficult question. And uh, when I when I started working on, on both critical media literacy and gender, um, I was so into this like, that I was not enjoying anything. I was watching or uh, to see a play you know, in a theater, a movie, or whatever, because I saw all these type of stereotypes ideas and stereotyped ideas and um, and violence and everything everywhere so it was so it was i had a very hard moment because i, I was not enjoying anything i was not having entertainment at all so i had to stop to for a while like to have some distance and also it's also like um uh, like it's saying to to be yourself distant for a for a, for a time and because you're so into this that you start seeing everything as a as a monster <laughs> and as a big machine you cannot like you handle you cannot control this everything around you or like everything you see on social media they convey messages so i think it's also distancing yourself from uh, from what you're consuming or this uh, it's also positive Having conversations with other is also with other people is also is also positive, and I would say like having this conversation with my students is also a healing process for me because it's not that I'm just analyzing and analyzing and and, and feeling that everything is the worst. Like it's war, it's this war, it's terrible. <laughs> me is terrible. You shouldn't consume anything and uh, like anything anymore. Um, having conversations and, and, and having the opportunity to share this knowledge with my students is also a healing process for me because then I, I, I find a place where I can really um, express my ideas and, they will, and, and I am satisfied because they are also learning something new or they discover something new. And so that's like a healing process as well. So I would say, yeah, yeah, you will, you will get overwhelmed in a point. You might be, you might have to have some distance and then we'll go back to it. <laughs> yeah, because of the way you're studying. But it makes, it starts to make part of our, of your life. But you will learn how to handle it <laughs> at a point. Yeah, at the beginning, it's overwhelming. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um... I think you both answered very honestly with vulnerability, and I think we appreciate that. And I think it was nice also to end on the topic of healing, um, that sometimes critical media literacy is, is not only useful to, to understand our world, but to heal from it. So thank you so much. We are out of time, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference today as well as tomorrow. Bye. Thank you.